and the combined heat of all of these set the whole thing fire. As soon as he got home from that trip, Ron took several of the samples to Galbraith Labs near Knoxville, Tennessee. The yellow balls in the center of the reddish rings proved to be 95.72% sulfur, with traces of several other elements, all of which he was told would contribute to an extremely high temperature fire. When Ron asked them if they could perform a BTU test to determine the degree of heat this would give off, he was told that they couldn't because it would damage their stainless steel testing chamber. The material surrounding the encapsulated sulfur was also tested and proved to be ash. At home, we did our own small test and burned some of the sulfur in a spoon. The purplish flame is indicative of the intense heat which prohibited our holding the spoon as it burned. We later discovered our spoon had holes in it from the fire. Then, we placed a small piece of the outer material also in the spoon and attempted to burn it. But it wouldn't burn at all. It didn't even darken. It was already completely consumed by fire and nothing was left to ignite. Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, and Bela, or Zor. We've seen some of the evidence, but now where are these sites located? The one we have just been in is located here, just below Masada, in a plain bordering the Dead Sea. The largest site is located here, behind the largest rock salt mountain in the world, Mount Sodom. Looking at a satellite photo of the area, the squarish shape of the city can be seen. This one too rested on the plain with one side nestled to the impassable mountains to the west. The smallest one can be seen here. It is located here and we feel confident in identifying this one as Bema or Zor. The square shape, so readily visible, tells us quite a bit about the city. In his book, Ancient Mesopotamia, by A. Leo Oppenheim, page 134, we read, quote, Square, rectangular, and round cities are typically new foundations. End quote. He explains how, as the cities grow in population, they expand their boundaries as needed, and never would the expansion radiate outward evenly on all sides. Remember how Lot pleaded with the angel to allow him to flee to Zor? For, he said, it is a little one. If this is Zor, we feel equally confident in calling this site behind Mount Siddham, Sodom. We also must note the Great Salt Mountain interposes between these two sites. If the salt pillar of Lot's wife still stands, we believe it would be in this area. The site below Masada is the second largest site and the best preserved. We believe this would have been Gomorrah. Now to find the next site we must go north to the tip of the Dead Sea. Admittedly this is not even in the region most people assume these cities were. There is no later scriptures to help us locate this one which we believe was Adma. So we will go to the last one, 
Zeboim. The last site is even further north. It lies here. Again, this is far from the commonly accepted areas for these cities, but in searching the scriptures, we found a most astonishing passage. In 1 Samuel, chapter 13, verses 16 through 18, we read how the Philistines set up camp in Mishmash. Dividing into three companies, one went north unto the way that leadeth to Ophrah. One went west, the way to Beth Horon, while the third went east, the way of the border that looketh to the valley of Zeboim towards the wilderness. Even though it had been hundreds of years since its destruction, the name of Zeboim still remained. It was common for new cities or new areas to receive the name of an old destroyed one in the area, such as the three Jerichos which span over 3,000 years. What evidence does the Bible give for the locations? The first mention is in Genesis 10:19 when the boundaries of the Canaanites are given. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest, unto Sodom, and Gomorrah, and Adma, and Zeboim, even unto Lasha, or Laish, which later was known as Dan. If we place these cities at the traditional site, all clustered together at the southern end of the Dead Sea, would that description make a lot of sense? We also have scriptures which tell us where these cities were not. As the borders of the Canaanites, we know that these cities were Canaanite. The area east of the Dead Sea especially the southern end, was known as Moab and Seir. In Deuteronomy 2, verses 9 through 12, the Lord was telling Moses not to distress the people of Moab or Seir, and he tells him who dwelt there in the past. The people were called Emims, who were giants, and Horims, but they were not Canaanites. Now, what about the idea that these cities are under the Dead Sea? Again, the Bible tells us clearly. In Genesis 14, soon after Lot chooses Sodom, we are told of an invading army who conquers the cities of the plain and take Lot and his family hostage. These invaders come around from the south, and the king of the cities of the plain come out to meet them in battle in the Vale of Siddim. Now, where is this Vale? The Salt Sea. This area was a valley, and it was full of slime pits, and the kings of the cities lost the battle there. The cities were located in the plain but they were not located in this valley because verse 8 tells us that the kings went out and this implies from their cities to battle. Once Ron and Richard had found the sulfur within the hardened capsules of burnt sulfur the next step was to see if there were other examples of sulfur occurring in this manner. We consulted geologists and chemists, we researched at libraries and universities, and the result is that we have found no other single case of sulfur 
in this form being found anywhere. What we have learned is that most native sulfur occurs in the crystalline form. Visiting the Smithsonian Museum, we photographed all of their specimens that we could find, and every one was the crystalline form, but none of the round, soft spheres the consistency of pressed powder. We researched where sulfur was to be found, and we came up with three locations. Number one, at or near the crater rims of active or extinct volcanoes where the sulfur was given off from gases. Number two, and less commonly, it's found in veins associated with sulfide ore minerals. Number three, and the largest deposits by far, are found in what are called salt domes and this is sedimentary rocks associated with anhydrite and gypsum and limestone and salt. In these first we have a layer of limestone completely barren of sulfur but usually containing anhydrite and gypsum. Beneath this lies a strata of limestone whose cracks, fissures, and seams may be impregnated with yellow crystals of native sulfur. We cannot overlook the fact that Mount Sodom is a salt dome and may contain native sulfur in its crystalline form. But this does not in any way explain these round sulfur balls in all of this ash. As tempting as it may be to speculate on how God accomplished the destruction of these cities, we will refrain from doing so. The final point we came up with is that we simply find no other instance anywhere of round, pressed powder consistency, balls of sulfur surrounded by hardened capsules of burnt sulfur embedded deeply in pure ash anywhere. We don't find them anywhere. Ron and Richard even traveled to the western United States and found a place where sulfur had been given off by volcanic activity. But here you can see it's in a thin layer of crystalline sulfur. The shape of the buildings and city walls was also a subject of our investigation. After all, was it possible that these were just unique, yet still natural? We drove from one end of the Dead Sea to the other many times. The areas before and after these sites were clearly different from them. We stopped to closely examine some of these and found them to simply be solid rock. They also lacked the distinct boundaries we found in the cities and displayed no shapes of structure. We found many characteristics in these sites that were just too much evidence to be coincidence. The Canaanites had built double walls in their cities, one higher than the other. We found this to be consistent throughout the city. We also found numerous raised platform areas which had only one or two structures on them, and this was consistent with temple and worship areas. <laughs> 